Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to this very exciting Civilizations in Review. I'm here with one of our fellows, Sabrina Pecorelli, um, who wrote the Qajar Dynasty, man, like a year ago, uh, to talk a little bit more about why she chose this empire and the excitement that's here, as well as another fabulous content writer, Ano Campusano, um, to help me co-moderate and chat more about this super modern empire it ended less than 100 years ago, which is very wild when we're talking normally BCE. So I'm going to read the uh, 101 word intro. I don't get to do that very often and I'm excited to. So uh, I'm gonna jump right in, ask uh, Sabrina the first couple of questions and we'll get rolling from there. As a reminder, you can see this live stream all over the place on Alphusaic's Facebook, where you are right now, as well as our website, our Spotify, our Instagram and our um, podcast. So you can listen, engage and learn from the incredible article that Sabrina has put together. And of course, there's even more to read and all the hyperlinks. So go to our website, alfusaic.net, to the civilizations section and learn all about the Qajars. I will begin. The Qajar dynasty was an Iranian royal family with Turkic origins that ruled Persia from 1789 to 1925 CE, before it was succeeded by the Pah Pahlavi dynasty, Iran's last monarchy. Under Qajar rule, Iran unified the territories of present-day Georgia, Azerbaijan, and Armenia, yet subsequently lost them to Russian expansionism. The Qajars also sparked modern Iranian nationalism when they granted cap capitulations and concessions to foreign governments for access to their natural resources. The Qajar dynasty had multiple weak rulers that failed to unify Iran as they lacked a central army, a strong bureaucracy, a taxation system, and a reliable stream of revenue. Whew, so many things to jump in here. Um, but I'd love to start with what uh, inspired you to choose them uh, to begin with. So let's start there. Thanks, Sabrina. Yeah, hey, uh, well, thank you for having me. First of all, I'm really, really excited to talk about this piece that I wrote a couple months ago. Um, so I ended up choosing the Qajars because when I started writing this, I was in a class I had actually just finished taking a course, um, a university course that was all about Iran. And it was about Iranian history, Iranian politics, Iranian foreign policy. And so I had really much gotten involved with this whole um, background on Iran. And I really wanted to continue my studies on it. And I was very interested in kind of its inception. And I was definitely very, I was in awe about this country that I hadn't really learned about before. And so I chose the Qajars precisely because they were um, an Iranian dynasty. And it was actually really cool because as I was writing this, I learned about things that I'd actually seen before previously in this class. And so it was kind of my goal to kind of continue the study and kind of get into, learn to more about this deeper. Hi, first of all, hi, Sabrina. Welcome so much. I, I really just um, am intrigued so much by um, the Qajar dynasty. I've never heard of it before. And just hearing you know, your passion and the way you talk about it, you learned it in the class and you brought it here. It's absolutely amazing. Um, so I'm learning with you here. And um, I was looking at the part, you know, the inception and decline. And it looks like it was, you know, like a lot of, um, of it, of power in like that different places. So I wanted to like, you know, kind of ask you about that. Yeah, so the Qajars actually lasted a lot longer than a lot of other dynasties in the region. Um, they spanned from the 1700s until the 1900s. Um, and they were actually the last dynasty before the Pahlavis took power in Iran. And they were the last Iranian monarchy before the Iranian revolution and then before the, the current Islamic government that we see today. So I thought that was incredibly interesting to kind of see what led up to this last Iranian monarchy and kind of the, the, the situation that was happening in the country and um, kind of the... I guess the unhappiness that the people felt with the, the Qajars and their ruling system and the capitulations that they gave to these foreign countries and that led eventually to the Pahlavis and to the revolution. Um, so, yeah. It's just so fascinating to hear like 19, 
25 CE as just a generic year. As again, some of these empires started in 4000 BCE, 5000 years before we even get to the Qajars. So this is kind of wild um, on the modern components. Um, you know, the fall of the Pahlavis is modern, the Islamic Republic of Iran. So it is, you know, really the, the grandfather in terms of I mean, the modern countries and an empire, but like in terms of chunks of Iranian history, this is the third youngest. I just I just find that so fascinating. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we have it on our site is that it is still the continuation. This empire has ended um, and yet is, is a very important marker of, of modern G, modern Iranian borders, relationships, all the things. So again, thank you for writing this article. It's why we have them. But I think for you, you probably have one of the, the you're probably one of the few, few writers who had a very easy time finding resources, given how it was only 100 years ago <laughs> um, that this empire existed. Actually, though, it wasn't as easy finding really? wow. as I thought it would. Oh. Um, I expected it to be a lot easier because, you know, it's more recent. It's, I guess, more in our time, you know, closer to our, our period of time. But it was actually pretty hard finding information. There were only a couple of reliable websites that I was able to find and all of them had very similar information it didn't dive as deep as I wanted them to that's super surprising um because some of these 4,000 year ago <laughs> empires are, are also full of information wild well regardless thank you for compiling in the many ways that you did um I, I still think it's somewhat relevant, even if it wasn't as easy to find information that you're thinking, you know, okay, this is only 200 years ago. Like I can somewhat wrap my head around this historical legacy, um, but that's fascinating to me that it was harder to find resources for what, three generations, four generations ago? Wow. Anyways, regardless, I, I, what I find so interesting about your article specifically um, is, is sort of the narrative journey you take us on your, your, I mean, in your intro alone, you, you really give all seven sections in, in one, which is a great, you know, sample for all future writers out there. Look at the Qajars, it's, it's written very wonderfully. Um, but, you know, what I just find so fascinating um, is, you know, especially in the modern influence, the modern part of modern influence, again, is like 50 years after this empire ends. Um, and, and just the, the incredible, like, rich, information the kings the the constitution house like all these pieces are really fascinating I, I wonder if you in your you know fascination of Iran and the Iranian community society government um and the modern influence of the Qajars if there's anything more you'd like to share with us um I mean what I found especially in, like interesting about their modern influence is that it is I guess one of the, it is the last, gener like the, the last dynasty before the Pahlavis. And so I feel like they kind of set up a lot of the, like the foundation and the found the founding infrastructure for the Pahlavis to, to do their thing and for kind of modern Iran to start build, building itself on top. And so they started with this foundation that was very necessary because when the Qajars took power, um, Iran was very fragmented and it was very d divided and it was more like, um, it was very tribal and it, they had all of these like smaller communities spread across the, the area and they started modernizing it through, you know, the telegraph lines and they built universities with uh, a lot of foreign influence. And so I really think that they did a lot of the, the legwork to build this foundation to this kind of power that is today yeah that was wonderfully put i you know whenever you were talking about earlier about the monarchy and the way that they were you know the last sort of like ruling power um before the Pahlavi really were there. I, I couldn't help but think about, you know, politics. It's the one thing that, you know, comes to my mind immediately. And so I was um, looking at the ruling system and, you know, just to thinking about um, a lot of the, what you mentioned, you just mentioned it now, which was sort of like, they were fragmented. There was, there was organization, there was power, there was something that, you know, that we, you know, it wasn't seen in that time. So, you know, it, it had a lot of influence and in how it relates to ruling system in Iran today, you know, can you talk about something like that?
sorry, I don't know if I, you know, said that correctly. I was going to say, um, do you think that the ruling system in that time had some sort of influence um, in the way that, you know, Iran is, you know, the government system is now or in that sort of thing? Um, interesting. Um, I don't really see a lot of correlation from how it was before, especially during the how it is now. I think maybe they now the the people saw how it was before and they try to improve it because it was very weak and it was very decentralized. And I think that it was more of like um, different cut the little the different um, communities had more power themselves instead of having a big central government. Um, but I think that now having unified the country and having brought all of them together under like a, like a central government, I think it definitely made it stronger. And I think that's why um, it's definitely more stable now um, because of this, this kind of more stable centralization, the stable central government. Um, yeah, I think they took this weaker decentralized thing and they were able to build upon it and kind of bring it together to make it stronger. Fascinating. Thanks for sharing that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting as, as they were taken over by the Pahlavis and then less than 50 years was the Islamic revolution. So it, it's interesting to see that precursor, even if it's not the exact same system, the, I mean, it's the same language it, 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 only because it's been 50 years, right? So there, there are still the cultural ties and you know, someone who was born in the Qajars may have been a ruler of like modern Iran. I mean, it, it, to me, it's just, it's really like ironically hard to wrap my head around how close this dynasty is to modern Iran. For some, for some reason, these 4,000, 3,000, 2,000 years ago is much simpler to sort of see the, the legacy and the buildings that still remain and the artifacts and the pottery. But for, for this to really be a generation between this dynasty and the modern country of Iran, um, it's very fascinating and something that I, I appreciate that you hit on every single section of like, no, this is really new. This just ended really. I mean, and the screaming things, a hundred years of nothing. Um, I, I find that so immensely fascinating. Uh, we don't have the Pahlavis written yet. Um, so I think I'll be saying the same thing on the next <laughs> live stream when the Pahlavis are finished, but, um, the Qajars is the most recent we have. And, and, you know, even throughout the rest of the Middle East, many other modern countries have already been established by this point so the Qajars are still in rule why some of these other countries um are they it's just it's just a really really interesting headspace on thinking about the many communities that make up the modern aspects of Iran I'm super fascinated always by the like buildings documents things that were left behind and if anything they probably were just converted into a different building not even destroyed so <laughs> I'm curious if you have even more like uh information about, uh, again, I'm gonna really harp on the modern influence section to me, just because again, that is so fascinating. And so it is, you know, a generation post. Um, but I mean, definitely like your last sentence of your modern influence section are the Qajar Arab building still in remaining today. And I was just curious if you know anything more about any of those specifically. It's okay yeah, and it definitely does tie in back to how this is more modern because I've co-moderated some of these events and I remember asking if some of the, the modern influences, some of the buildings were still there and they had been kind of taken down by other civilizations or other dynasties that came after. But I think that's something cool about the Qajar is that since they are so modern, a lot of their influence is still there. You know, it's still, it doesn't have, it hasn't had enough time for it to be like taken down by other civilizations or other dynasties coming in. And, um, there are still a lot of these buildings that were created, that were brought up during the Qajar era, um, like the Constitution House, the Golestan Palace Complex, the Nasir al Muk al Mosque. And so I think it's a wonderful way of kind of remembering and recognizing this dynasty and its effect that it had in Iran. Um, and the fact that it definitely wasn't that long ago, but a lot of these infrastructure and these buildings that were created during this time were still there. Um, but um, quickly, going back to your other point before, um, 
I think it's interesting that since the Pahlavis really were not that far behind in history, um, I think that some of the actions that the, that the Qajars took might have also contributed to leading up to the Iranian Revolution. Um, especially the, uh, the concessions that the Qajar, they were giving away a piece of Iran to these foreign governments. And um, I actually remember learning this in my class where basically um, the foreign governments like the British were getting an excessive amount of money from these concessions and the Iranian population wasn't. And so just little things like that, I think eventually culminated in such a, such like, a, a, I guess like an unhappiness with the, the ruling system that it culminated in the revolution. It just kind of added on. Wow, what, what a uh, double legacy influence. That, man. Yeah, <laughs> that was, that was, no, that's incredible. The way that, you know, they were able to kind of like inf infiltrate through the influence that they had at the very beginning and in that time, even though, like we mentioned, um, it wasn't that long ago. I just think it's fascinating. And that was, you know, exactly why I hit on that point about, you know, the ruling system. I felt like a lot of their, accomplishments, a lot of the things that they got to push through was a lot of, you know, their ideas and, you know, put in, in a particular way that I was even seeing about the election, you know, um, bodies that they elected in, like in their government as part of their accomplishments. I think that it had a lot of um, power and a lot of dynamic behind the things that they did, that it kind of just went on. And even for the Pahlavi, you know, government short-lived, but done there um i think it definitely feels like they had all that the influence at the very um in a fundamental way um yeah i was also reading about the ar uh, architecture and the way that you know like you mentioned those buildings are still there so it's it's something that you know we get to see today and it's still part of like their history their influence and you know part of like who they are in today's world Uh, just incredibly fascinating because we could we could talk for <laughs> for days about Iranian politics and, and the revolution and, and all the things we won't because that's not the Qajar specifically but to the fact that the seeds were sown uh, at the end of the Qajar rule given the concessions and, and just general like ruling system complaints uh, you know not appeasing the community or the civilians um, to potentially be one of the indicators that led to the revolution is, again, just so, so interesting. Um, I know you've talked a lot about, I'm sort of shifting gears, about the capitulations of concessions as part of their economic policy. Um, but I was curious, um, specifically in your economic section, I, I know you talk a lot about the oil, um, which, you know, is a huge part of modern Iran's economy. I was curious if, if that was a big part of the Qajar economy as well, if you know. Yeah, so um, especially with the concessions, the, the Darcy concession, where basically um, the Qajars gave this British entrepreneur, William Knox Darcy, um, exclusive rights to search for oil in Iran. And basically whatever oil they would find, um, Britain would get an immense Jars as the head of government, they would definitely get a lot of the profits that remained. But the people saw this more as um, just, you know, giving away Iranian sovereignty and giving away na Iranian national pride, which is the oil, um, to these foreign entities. And so multiple concessions, um, not just with oil, with like other natural resources. And it definitely kind of culminated in this um, kind of grievances towards the government. Yeah, most, most, I, I was actually just, you know, just thinking that that was going so well with that, um, how they were in so many wars at the time, you know, I feel like the Qajars kind of went through their, 
fair share of like fighting for what they wanted and install their dynasty. And, you know, you know, to think about that, the economics portion of that is the one thing that usually kind of takes a hit on, you know, who they are and like what, what they end up becoming, especially during like war times. And, you know, it's, it's just, you know, interesting to hear that um, a lot of what they were pride, uh, pride for, for, which was their oil was taken away. Cause I think it was kind of like, you know, the idea of like having that so that they could thrive and, and that sort of thing. And, and, you know, it's just interesting to see how like one thing led to another and kind of just, you know, put it all together for what, it, you know, it resulted as. I, I, I mean, I know I've been repeating myself so many times, but this is just so incredibly interesting to me that the, the the link is very strong to how we think of Iran today was the Qajars right before it. Um, but I, I want to sort of back up a little bit to the beginning of the Qajar dynasty, the, you know, the, the 1700s. Um, and I know that, you know, they the long line of Persian dynasties, they are just sort of following that space. But I'm curious if you have any sort of in their like inception, how they actually began, if you have any sort of pieces. Um, I, I know obviously, as you mentioned, the Qajar tribe leader, Ag Agha Muhammad Khan Qajar, who since the Qajar dynasty is named from, obviously was the, the military leader that led it. But I was just curious if you have any more like inception pieces. We, we know how it ends and, and is very much seen in modern Iran, but any sort of initial aspects of Qajar you'd like to talk about or mention? Can you repeat that for me, please? Yeah, of course, no problem. I was just curious on like the inception, beginning of the Qajar dynasty in its sort of long line of Persian dynasties, anything that, that popped up in your research. And if you're, if you're not able to answer me, it's a, it's a treat for our uh, listeners. Go to the website, read more about it. Um, you, you wrote about it already. I just love to hear more thoughts, but I know you have some connection issues now, so that's totally fine. And you're muted. It's it's okay. We'll continue on. Um, so one of the, the last questions to sort of wrap up here then, um, and thank you, Anna, again, for your engagement too. Really great insights and questions I would not have thought of. So thanks. Um, this last little piece I would like to, to focus on really is um, the 1907 amendment called the uh, Supplementary Fundamental Law. You wrote about it all in your key accomplishment section. Listeners, go check it out. A lot of cool stuff there. But it's fascinating because, it, at least in the United States, the First Amendment is, is cornerstone, really, to how Americans conduct life, you know, the, the five freedoms. And this 1907 amendment seems to be identical to America's or the United States' First Amendment, which I find very interesting in terms of connections or if they wrote that to inspired by the United States' first, I, I'm very curious about it. So I was curious if you have any pieces on that specific point, um, if you're able to share. Yeah, so uh, in 1906, um, basically the Qajar rule wasn't going as well as they had hoped. Um, and the, the fifth Qajar Shah was, incredibly incompetent. And so this incompetence led to a revolution. And in 1906, um, they pushed to rewrite the laws um, and to um, kind of pass this um, amendment in 1907 called the Supplementary Fundamental Law and basically guaranteed um, citizens' rights. Um, basically, it guaranteed citizens' rights um, in all these things like free speech, press, association, life, and property, um, a lot of the things that we see here today. Um, and it kind of, it almost like jolted the, the Qajars from uh, a, a traditional sense where they were before in more of a modern world, um, especially in the 1900s. Um, and also, again, going back to before, it set up the foundation for the Pahlavis to rule um, and to kind of keep modernizing this the, the country um, forward. Um, also, since we are talking about key accomplishments, I feel like we haven't talked about this yet. Um, the Qajars did declare Tehran the capital of Iran 
And I think that's really incredibly cool because it is still the capital today. Um, and it was declared during their rule. So I think it's a, it's a really incredibly cool kind of accomplishment that most people probably don't even know that it was the Qajars, but yeah, so Iran was named the capital under their rule and um, it is still today. That is absolutely wonderful. Like I, I'm a huge fan of like things that, you know, just like last on and have that power over time. And that was sort of like the thing that I was thinking about, you know, with the, yeah, oh my God, that's just I, absolutely incredible. Now, you know, even, even in that time, it, I love it today. <laughs> Yeah, what, what a great uh, tidbit to end on um, as we wrap up. Um, thank you, Sabrina, for writing about this and nerding out with Anna and I. Um, uh, we both, all three of us, find Iran very interesting and intriguing as a place to study. And for the Qajars to have chosen the capital, so many of the modern buildings, uh, styles of ruling, leading the Bahlavis. I mean, we can go on and on and have for 30 minutes. So we'll wrap up now. But just incredibly interesting uh, insights. And again, your research and uh, articles and engagement, incredible. So thank you, Sabrina, for uh, taking the time to write about the Qajars, but also diving really deep into um, this conversation day. I super appreciate it. Definitely had a lot of fun writing about it and learning about it. And I always love nerding out with you guys. So it was a pleasure. <laughs> Thank you, Sabrina. Of course, yeah. thank you. A highlight to my Friday as well to nerd out and talk about, I guess not ancient today, but at least history. Not ancient. Uh, <laughs> well, thank you all for tuning in to this very exciting Civilizations in Review. Um, a really fascinating empire, dynasty, kingdom um, that we talked about today uh, that is out there and pretty recent. So if you ever go to Tehran, the Qajar's uh, influence is very ever-present. Um, so thank you again, Sabrina, for writing it, Anna, for chatting with me. Uh, make sure to check us out at alfusaic.net. That's A-L-F-U-S-A-I-C.net to learn more. Thanks so much. Have a good night.